Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our webinar today. This is the second part in a three-part protein webinar series by the Pet Sustainability Coalition. We're gonna get started in just a few minutes. We have a very full house today. But in the meantime, we have a poll up that we'd love to hear. If you have read our four-factor framework for sustainable evaluation, so while we're waiting to join, if you just let us know if you've read the report in that poll. And also we've got a chat feature on the webinar today. It's at the bottom middle of your screen. We'd love it if you could test that out and introduce yourselves. Let us know where you're calling in from today. In the meantime, we have PSE team members that are maintaining that chat and will be able to help you if you're having any problems. So once again, thank you so much for joining us today and we'll get started in about one minute. Good afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is Melissa Bauer, and I am the Director of Sustainability and Strategic Initiatives at the Pet Sustainability Coalition. We've got great content today, so we're going to go ahead and dive right in. But first of all, thank you everyone so much who uh, answered the poll. So we've been asking, have you downloaded and read the four-factor framework for sustainable protein evaluation? And it looks like uh, almost two thirds of you or a little over two thirds of you have. So that is great. That's also a huge uh, jump from this uh, webinar last month. So we're so excited and we will be sharing more on about the report, how to download it and uh, more information about that on the webinar today. But let's dive into the content. So first of all, a little bit of housekeeping. Everyone on the calls today, microphone and video has been turned off. I'd like to introduce you to a couple of features of the webinar this morning. You have at the bottom of your screen, both a chat box and a question and answer. Um, in the Q&A is where we will be taking questions for our speakers at the end of this session. Um, but please be feel, feel free to be dropping questions in the Q&A there at the time. We also have the chat feature. If you're having any problems with the webinar today, we have the PSE team maintaining and there to support you. But we will be taking those Q&A in uh, the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Also, one last bit of housekeeping. Uh, the recording and the slides from today's call will be sent to everybody who uh, registered for today's call. So you will be able uh, to get those. So no need to be frantic screenshotting or anything. So for those of you who are not uh, familiar with uh, the Pet Sustainability Coalition, we are a nonprofit industry association. We work in the pet industry with over 200 different members. We're also a global organization. We have about two thirds of our membership here in North America, uh, another 30% approximately in Europe and the EU. And we also have members and are growing fast in Australia, Asia and South America. And we serve a dual purpose. So we work with our 200 plus members to help them measure, improve and celebrate their sustainability performance. But we also work together to bring the pet industry together uh, to solve social and environmental issues that are too big for any one company or any one sector of the pet industry to solve. And that's what will brings us here today. So today we'll be specifically focused on sustainable sourcing in the pet industry, looking at uh, proteins that are sourced in the pet industry. 
And if you haven't had a chance to take a look at it for our one third of our people on our call, um, we're gonna frame our conversation around a PSC resource that I hope that you check out and, and read and become familiar with, which is the four factor framework of pet protein ingredient sustainability. So as I mentioned on the beginning of the call, this is the second webinar in a three-part series. In the first part of the webinar, our executive director, Caitlin Dudash, introduced the four-factor framework as a way for brands to make responsible sourcing decisions for proteins for their company, looking at these four different aspects of sustainability. So environmental impact, social impact, nutrition and animal welfare. And this framework allows companies and gives them the tools and resources to make informed decisions on balancing these four different factors in protein work. So in the second part of this series, I'm really excited to welcome um, some experts to this conversation. So I would invite uh, Darren Vanstone, who is the Director of Corporate Engagement and Policy from Chrono Sustainability Limited, Dave Carter, who is the principal at Crystal Springs Consulting, and Jim Kleinschett, who is the co-founder and CEO from Other Half Processing, to join this conversation. These are all experts specifically in uh, different aspects of sustainable protein sourcing in the pet industry. I also want to briefly mention that we have also been working with Doc Kate Dr. Kate Chivaler at the University of Guelph, and she's been really leading our nutritional work as part of the four-factor framework, but unfortunately, she wasn't able to join us today. So, gentlemen, uh, thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to uh, ask you all um, a question, and when I do, please um, introduce yourself to this fantastic audience that we have. Um, so to kick off today, um, I want to talk about today's kind of current state of protein sourcing in the pet industry. So I'd love to start with you, uh, Jim. Uh, Jim, first of all, can you please introduce yourself? And then can you talk about the state of transparency and traceability, specifically in beef supply chains, uh, particularly for secondary ingredients, materials? There's a lot of conversations um, around uh, this topic in the pet industry. Absolutely. Uh, thanks for having me, Melissa, and I appreciate this time with PSC um, and being part of this panel with everyone else. It's exciting to have these other folks here, and I'm looking forward to learning from them. Um, uh, so I'm Jim Kleinschmidt. As he said, I co-founded Other Half with my brother, Mark, and I'm the CEO. Uh, we grew up on a farm in Northeast Nebraska with parents who are early farm and regenerative leaders. And in the work we do, we try to carry on those principles that they instilled in us at home. Um, what we do is we work within the meat processing byproduct value chain to develop traceable supply chains tied to regenerative grass-fed and organic claims with the other half. So kind of relevant for today's uh, webinar, considering when we say the other half, we're talking about the non-meat part of the animal, which really does equate to almost half of the animal or even more sometimes. Um, and the work we do with this, we do... We start with hides is where we got started as, as uh, maybe some of you have heard of our name before. We were lucky enough uh, to have an early partnership with Timberland. And in that, we got into the beef supply chain very directly on how to identify traceability. Um, we actually, and I'll just explain this as a background because then I'll get into your question, Lisa. You know, how we do it with them kind of helps you understand what we do and what we understand, which is we started working with them on actually how do you do traceability of hides from the farm all the way through to the tannery. And so we work with the farmers and ranchers to verify their regenerative cattle production there. And we actually return a producer premium payment to them directly. Um, but we also then buy that physical hide from those animals from the associated processor and then transport those to the relevant tannery and sell them you know, into the supply chain. So, so that's where we got started. Um, we are starting to work in other parts of the other half, because obviously hide is just one very large part of it, but only one part. And so we're learning some about it, but I can't claim huge amount of understanding about it, you know, about all the other ingredients and how they are used, because we don't do rendering, we don't do all of the secondary byproducts. So just, I want to make sure that qualification is there first. But what we find with transparency and traceability is that basically it is possible, but it's very challenging. And a lot of it comes down to your scale of processing and your equipment associated with it. And do you have space equipment capacity to actually collect, separate, and store these materials? Because that's what we talk about when we talk about having a different value there. And we're seeing that there is some ability there, but it's mostly in the smaller to medium-sized plants. If you go too small, 
they don't have the capacity, uh, you know, or necess or the market. Let's be very clear uh, to pull it out. If you go too big, uh, often it seems that many of those systems are too um, are too integrated and not able to separate things out. So we're finding the transparency and traceability is there. It's able to be done, but it it requires different investments and different focuses, and certainly a different pull from the market. And we're seeing that in leather, and we're hoping to see it in the pet food sector. So. Great. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Darren, love to call on you. So Jim brought up a really good point around availability. So uh, thrilled to introduce you all to Darren Vanstone. Uh, Darren, if you can uh, introduce yourself to our audience um, and then talk about kind of what is the availability for uh, percentage of animals raised for consumption around alignment with kind of global animal welfare standards. I know a standard that we talk about a lot is the five freedoms. Yeah, absolutely. Both. Thanks so much for that. And uh, again, thank you for having me involved. It's great to talk to everybody. This has been really interesting, really exciting to meet Jim and Dave. Uh, so really appreciate you having me. So I am a, a consultant, so I, I work sort of two jobs uh, because I can't hold a single full-time job. Uh, so a director of corporate engagement policy at Kronos, but also as a managing director at uh, Okatra Limited. And so we work across most animal uses. Um, a lot of my work has really been on animal agriculture and the raising of farm animals, but also work on uh, at the animal trade um, and, and animals entertainment. So most of the animal uses. Um, I work in mostly in the, in the human food uh, industry because that's sort of where most of the work is right now. Um, where I, I support the Global Coalition for Animal Welfare, which is 13 of the largest uh, food companies that have gotten together and sort of tried to figure out a roadmap for animal welfare going forward. Um, so I've been lucky enough to be able to be on farms across the world. Um, I've sat on the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Beef, the Global Roundtable for Sustainable Beef, um, and have done some other sort of industry work at well, as well. So I'm lucky to have this really sort of um, I just like to go places, I think is probably what I'm getting at. But I thought we would just really uh, quickly talk about animal welfare and the five freedoms, because I think as we start to work through it, it's just kind of good for us to, to break those two apart, right? So the five freedoms is a model that describes animal care practices, and those are the practices that we expect to reduce or eliminate negative experiences. When we talk about animal welfare, we're talking about the experience of the animal itself, and when we think about animal welfare, the welfare of the animal is an outcome of that care that we provide, right? So that's just to separate those two. So especially for animals, and this is for animals that are under human control. And I think, you know, just the point is to recognize that welfare is an outcome of what we do and that the five freedoms or any other model that you use, and there are a bunch of them, will actually um, sort of describe the care that reduces suffering or gives them good lives or whatever uh, the, the value of that model is. So uh, I've been asked to actually explain, the, say the five freedoms and because I never remember them, I've got them here. So uh, first one is freedom from hunger and thirst. And we do that by providing ready access to fresh water and a diet to maintain full health and vigor. Second is freedom from discomfort by providing an appropriate environment. And we do that by providing shelter and a comfortable resting area. Three is freedom from pain and fruit disease, which we do by preventing, um, preventing or rapid diagnosis or treatment. Uh, fourth is the freedom to express most normal behaviors. And we do that by providing sufficient space, proper facilities and company of the animal's own kind. And finally, the fifth freedom, which is freedom from fear and distress by ensuring conditions of treatment, which avoid mental suffering, right? So when we think about this, what we're, what we're trying to do is reduce or eliminate negative experiences. And that just really gets us to a neutral form of welfare. To answer the, answer the question that you actually asked, uh, we're going to say that 99% of the uh, people that are of the, the animals raised in the U.S. are likely read, uh, raised under intensive confinement systems that are not set up to meet the welfare behavioral needs, as described by uh, the five freedoms and your work. Um, I think globally, you know, on any of the sort of flock and herd, the flock animals, so that would be uh, broilers, turkeys, layers, uh, fin fish, and pigs, production is almost the same. So the actual production facilities are the same. Um, you know, a broiler barn in Thailand looks the same as one in Alabama. 
um, for the most part, they're using the same breeds. So really the, the welfare outcomes of those are determined by the production system, not by the region. Great. Um, yeah, perfect. Thanks, Cher. That no I I tend to forget what the five freedoms are too. So having them written. Never remember uh, them. Yeah, I remember there are five, but I, I tend to forget them. Um, our last guest that I'm really excited to welcome is uh, Dave Carted. So Dave, uh, the question that I want to uh, pose to you is please um, introduce yourself like all of our fabulous speakers today to our audience. Um, and then I would really love to get your opinion um, you've worked really closely with PSC to do a deep dive on chicken supply chains, and you've also worked with several companies to source sustainable ingredients. How easy or difficult, in your opinion, is it to find pet food ingredients at scale that are low environmental impact, ethically raised, highly nutritious, and processed within an equitable system that support the livelihood of farmers, producers, and processors, right? So, um, you know, what is it even possible for a brand to meet these four freedoms? Or for, excuse me, four factors. Yeah, no, it is. It is possible, and so is world peace. Yeah. Um, so just as as background, um, I've been hanging around agriculture for about the last forty five years. I spent twenty five years working with a general farm organization, the Farmers Union, uh, both regionally and nationally. And so I work every with everything from those contract poultry growers down in the in the southeast to ranchers in the west. Um, in 2001, I decided it was never too late to have a midlife crisis, so um, I left Farmers Union, and like Darren, I can't hold down one job. I serve now part-time as the uh, director of the National Bison Association. We represent the bison ranchers around the country, and then I uh, ended up in 2001 on the National Organic Standards Board, so I uh, took a deep dive into organics, but then also started my own consulting business, Crystal Springs Consulting. And out of that, uh, a couple of guys, some people may know Anthony Zalezi and, and Myron Lasconich and I started Pet Promise back in 2003, which was really the first pet food company that could trace where their proteins came from. And so as a result of that, I've done a lot of work with Pet Sustainability Coalition, uh, worked with the Pet Food Institute to write up draft organic regulations for pet food and have worked with some individual companies. Um, more recently, I've been working now with a lot of tribal nations on their food security uh, issues. And then my wife and I actually have a herd of bison that we run in partnership with two other ranchers on a ranch that's owned by the Savory Institute uh, east of Denver. So it, we're part of regenerative um, agriculture. So to, to circle back to the question, it is difficult. Um, and you have to understand the production models. Darren talked about that a, a, a little bit in the, in the poultry. Well, when you think about particularly poultry and pork, those are completely vertically integrated systems. And so, you know, if you're a poultry farmer, you don't own the birds. Um, you are a contractor for the company that raises that. And so on one hand, that's easier to have traceability and protocols because it, it's very uniform. On the other hand, um, it's open to a lot of abuses when you talk about you know, the, the full realm of what is sustainability. A big chunk of the big poultry companies have been settling price fixing lawsuits here recently. Um, there is a lot of work going on uh, through the Packers and Stockyards administration right now to try and, and crack down on the contract grower abuses and what they call the tournament system that really is abusive to those, those producers. So, you know, that's, that's one aspect. When you get to things like beef and bison, that is, is not vertically integrated. You have your processors that are buying their animals from individual feeders or farmers or producers. And so it's, it's a little more complex. And then when we take that to the you know, production level is that most of those ingredients go, go straight from the processor to the manufacturing. You've got those pre-processors out there that go out and buy, buy the ingredients and create the slurries and, and the likes that, that go. And it's most economically for manufacturers, if they're going to make something, to just say, you know, I need a slurry that is a combination of 
chicken and turkey and you know whatever and it needs to be this percentage moisture but once you start saying well i need a slurry that is you know certified gap certified organic whatever you know then the the complexity then when you think about <clears throat> the core ingredients in so many pet foods which are uh, meals particularly chicken meal um you know that is something that goes through a rendering system and with very little exception there, there are a couple of facilities out there that are exceptions but most of the rendering system in the u.s is is a uh, continuous flow rendering system and so when they're running one batch of ingredients through and they decide to change it out that line never stops and gets cleaned out um, and so it's very difficult to have that traceability on those ingredients and then when you go down the ingredient panel um, you know with your your grains and your soy and everything else a lot of that just gets gets blended in so it is difficult but it's not impossible it's not impossible and i would say that we are at the threshold right now of some real change that is going to make it easier the pandemic I, I like to use the Wizard of Oz analogy. The pandemic ripped back the curtain on the fallacy of the resiliency and the efficiency of the concentrated industrialized food processing system, and particularly the meat processing system. The disruption that was created by COVID was just immeasurable in terms of ranchers having to euthanize animals and workers getting sick and, and the like. And so we've seen, you know, a decentralization start to take place. I, I mentioned that I'm doing a lot of work with tribal nations. And over the last few years, you've got uh, several of the tribes that are putting up their own meat processing facilities. Yeah. The Quapaw, the Osage Nation, uh, the Muscogee Creek Nation in Oklahoma, the Blackfeet up in Montana. Mm -hmm. And these are facilities that are smaller facilities that are going to be more difficult you're not going to get that critical mass coming out of one facility, but there are real opportunity for us to, to do some, some things. And there's two other things now coming down the pike. USDA has just announced a $1 billion commitment to new resources to, for a more resilient and equitable meat processing system. Uh, the first round of, of grants are going to come out in April. Uh, $150 million in funding to support 15 new processing facilities. Wow. And then later on, there's going to be more of those. And then this last weekend, USDA announced another $1 billion commitment for climate smart agricultural yeah. practices. And how do we quantify those? So I think out of all of that, there's a real opportunity for us to kind of re-envision the whole uh, supply chain and sourcing model yeah. to, to accomplish what we want to do. That's fantastic. And that's really up to date news, Dave. So I appreciate that perspective. Um, Darren, I want to I want to ask you a question. So Dave brought up a really good, uh, interesting point around trade offs, right? So we tend to think of these four factors as really siloed. Um, but that might not always be the case. Can you talk about some of the trade offs between the four factors given current proteins? So for example, are there times when you know, maybe better treatment of the animals and better welfare leads to increased environmental impact or something like that. Sure, yeah, thanks for that. Um, yeah, so look, I think that there are already trade-offs built into our system and I think Dave has articulated a bunch of them really well. So what this work is really just about having conversations about if those really are the trade-offs we want to make, right? So those trade-offs were done sort of without a lot of stakeholder engagement. And I think, you know, that this is really what we're doing. We're just trying to figure that out. So I'm not going to talk about nutrition because I have absolutely no idea. Um, but I think, for example, on the social side, I think there is, you know, we see lots of benefits to people who actually get to engage with animals that are less stressed and, um, you know, in systems that are that are meeting their needs, health wise, behavior wise. Um, and, you know, so those animals are going to be a little bit easier to handle. So, you know, you can ask Dave the difference between handling a bison versus a dairy cow. Right. So one of them is is very easy to handle. That's an easier life. Nobody gets beaten up by a, by a dairy cow. Lots of people get bit, bit, beaten up by bison. I think on the animal welfare side, you know, I think 
part of our issue is that we focus on a really small set of indicators, right? So um, I think, and then we measure really small things. So for example, when we talk about in improving the lives of sows, for example, we talk, we currently measure in pigs per sow per year, which means that we place the emphasis on production over health and welfare. What that means is we get animals that are in production for a much shorter period of time. So it's probably in the long term, not as productive, not as environmentally friendly. So there are ways that it works. When we talk about the broiler chickens that Caitlin mentioned at, at last month, um, one of the things we're always looking to do is slow their growth rate because um, there, there are a bunch of negative welfare impacts are associated with conventional breed growth rates. And slowing growth rates is going to keep birds in barn for longer. They're going to get more inputs, more outputs. Um, and then even reducing their density is going to give them give them fewer barn birds per barn, right? So Caitlin again mentioned that, that we see some improvement in mortality by doing this. Uh, so 5% on fast growing breeds versus 2% of mortality for slower growing breeds. So 3% difference in the number of animals that actually make it from placement until slaughter. Um, and those animals, uh, we're losing a lot more because in the in this fast growing breeds, we're seeing that a lot of the mortality spikes at the end after we fed them for 35 or 42 days or, or 60 days or whatever that looks like. So, you know, there's some balances there. I think ultimately we don't really have a great understanding uh, of all of the impacts because we tend to look at these really, you know, single, single barn, single flock measures as opposed to systemic measures. And we know that there's a lot that can grow there. Ultimately, the system has been designed to be as, as productive and efficient as it can. I think there's likely going to be some uh, um, impacts across, uh, you know, I, I think really the trade-offs are just deciding which of the four, you know, the, the, the most, the best option is not necessarily going to be the best option in each of the four factors. So, thank you, Darren. Um, I'd like to pose a question to all of you gentlemen. Um, so you all work in industries that are outside to the pet industry or pet industry adjacent, where much of the movement towards a more sustainable agricultural model is coming from. In your opinion, how is the pet industry uniquely positioned to play a role in the sustainable food system? Then I'd love to start with you, Jim. Well, it's huge. It already plays an enormous role. And I just have to back up, Darren. I have been beaten up by dairy cows. Anyone who's milked <laughs> a new cow, a new mother, <laughs> has, has, has run into the wrong end of a hoof along the way. Um, and so just to be clear, and, and that's not even getting into bulls and stuff. So, anyway, um, but uh, yeah, so from a pet sector, I mean, they already play a huge role, right? They're an underpinning role um, and, and they do, I mean, they buy 25% of the animal at least, right? And so the question is how can it be better at helping these differentiated markets, these differentiated systems, I think is really the question. So it's not all focused on the space where uh, through the, the human grade, right? The stuff coming out of USD organic only, but looking at these other differentiated opportunities that that lead, that are traceable back to the right things on the land. So I think that's the real opportunity we have. And I think it's something as a pet owner, I look for in ingredients personally. So I'm, I, I know other people are, I think other people are looking for that. They're looking up for themselves and their kids. And so we hope, and it's not saying there's not a role for all that. There is a deep role for, mm. we need to have that organic recycling role, that rendering and other stuff as we have to, but how it gets done and how they think about the value propositions today that can come, that honestly weren't there years ago. So it's not a surprise it wasn't built for that, um, but they're there today. And I think that's the key for it to help pull in the same direction as some of our meat, milk and other markets. That's fantastic, Jim. Dave, what do you think? What is the role for, uh, the pet industry to build kind of a more sustainable agricultural model? Well, I just have to weigh in on, on the first thing there because I've never been kicked in the head by a, a new bi mother bison. Um, and that's because in the bison business, when it's calving season, that's the best time to go fishing. Uh, they have calved by themselves for thousands of years. They don't need our help. So um, anyway, back to your you know thing, and I will keep my bison hat on here, is that um, you know, we recognize that we're involved in restoring these animals, we're protecting the environment, but we can't do it without the consumer. Um, Ted Turner likes to say the best way to save a bison is to eat it. 
And we've been, we've actually launched a program in the National Bison Association that we call Partner in Bison Restoration, which we'd love to get more pet food companies involved in, which is to tell the story that when you eat sustainable, you know, when you eat bison, when your pets eat bison, when you eat sustainably produced products, you're creating the incentive for those farmers that produce those products. Mm -hmm. They can't be ecologically sustainable unless they're economically sustainable. And so that's, you know, that's important. The pet industry plays a really unique and important role in that because if you're a processor, a meat processor, and I'll say beef or, you know, bison or whatever, you can't make all of your money on tenderloins, ribeyes, and strip steaks. You have to sell that whole animal. And when we look at it right now, the big processors, they may only get pennies for the, the drop, the off all, the, the byproducts, whatever you want to call it, but they get pennies. Those smaller plants that are out there, unfortunately, many times they're paying somebody to haul those ingredients to a landfill. Oh yeah. And that's the difference between profit and loss when you are in a real narrow margin business. Mm -hmm. And so the more that we can think about ways to work with networks of smaller producers to source those ingredients, we can kind of flip that so that those smaller processors that are doing things the right way are getting pennies or maybe dimes for those that helps them balance what we call the carcass utilization. Yeah, I think that's, you bring up a really, really important point, Dave. But before we move on to that, I wanna give Darren the opportunity. Do you think that there is a unique role for the pet industry to play in building kind of more sustainable protein systems? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I really don't know that I have anything to add to what Dave and Jim said. I do think um, there is a, you know, I think the human food uh, chain industry has sort of driven this conversation. Um, but I, I think, um, you know, there's certainly a lot of room in that conversation to have the Pet Sustainability Coalition and to have you know, leather producers and, and others, um, you know, cosmetics companies, ingredients companies, all that sort of stuff. I think there's real value to having that. I think ultimately this is, just as we spoke about the trade-offs that were made, you know, in, to get to modern agriculture, I think the trade-offs that we need to choose now need to account for the needs of the different stakeholders, um, including producers. And I think, you know, that's, that's a big one as well. So yeah, I think there's a huge role to play on sort of the policy, um, side as well. Well, thank you, Darren. Um, so I want to I want to pose a question to all of you gentlemen. Is there any silver bullet, right? Is there one, you know, big uh, idea that, you know, would require zero trade offs when it comes to reaching all factors? So questions that we get asked at PSC all the time is what about insect protein? Or, you know, should we be feeding our pets uh, a vegetarian or vegan diet? So is less meat or no meat viable for your, you know, for the solution? And I think there's going to be some conflicting opinions on this panel. I could be wrong, <laughs> um, but uh, happy to start with you, Jim. And no single bullet. I mean, there's no, I mean, I think obviously nutritional needs have to trump a lot of that discussion, but I think we have to, it, it, BBs, we always say, instead of bullets, right? We use a shotgun. We have to have a lot of different things. And then to Dave's point, and he knows my dad, so he would not be surprised he says this. I mean, you got to, you can't think green if you're in the red as a farmer, is what my dad would always say. And the point there is how do you make the value proposition work regardless? And so you get the outcomes you want on the land. If insects can get you there, partly, and I'm sure they probably can at some level, they might be a component. I have no idea. They seem like they're, they're building into it. I'm not aware of it. Vegan, there's obviously some vegetative role. It depends on the nutrition. Um, I, but I will argue, and I think this is the piece we didn't start with, that animal agriculture, like all agriculture, has the ability to both be you know, incredibly negatively impactful and incredibly positive. And I don't think you can't pick any of these out individually and say they're good. In fact, the problem is that's what we do. Animal and in, animal livestock integrated with crop production is one of the best things. And I'm guessing there's maybe even an insect role there. 
but there is underneath it all because that's what feeds it underneath in the soil microbiomes and everything. And so to me, it's not one or the other. It's literally being clear about pick the systems you want it from and help support those in policy and as a buyer. And on regenerative, you know, cattle production, I feel like that and bison and other ruminants have the ability to help us with a lot of our goals and really with very few trade-offs. Um, but we need to support the people on the land, the tribes and others, especially the folks who this comes from, um, to grow the capital, to have the ability to do that. Otherwise, we're not going to get these other options out there. We're going to choose the least cost option again, whether it's better or not for us and our pets. And all. Dave, I'm guessing you're not wishing the whole pet industry went vegan, if I had to guess. Uh, gosh, I, I know, yeah. Shock, shock. Um, no, and, and let me, and, and all, and, and Jim hit it just exactly on the head that it can be extremely damaging or it can be extremely beneficial. And particularly, you know, I'll focus on ruminants here right now, the four-legged critters, is there's been so much talk about livestock is destroying the environment, that it's, you know, doing all of these bad things. And so there's a natural presumption from some people to say, okay, the best, best way to save the environment is to quit eating meat. Well, the question I would pose is what would our livestock or what would our environment look like if we did not have those grazing animals out there? Uh, more than 30% of the North American landmass evolved as grassland ecosystems. And those grasslands, um, they evolved in concert with grazing animals with bison being the keystone species. Mm -hmm. And the University of, of uh, California, Davis, a couple of years ago, put out a report that talked about grasslands are a more resilient carbon trap than forests. I like to call the grasslands our, our North America's rainforest because they're mm -hmm. incredibly efficient at taking carbon out of the air and locking it down into the soil. And unlike forests, when a fire comes through, all the carbon doesn't go back out in the atmosphere, it's down in the grass. But those grasslands can't do it by themselves. Mm -hmm. Those grasslands evolve to need the grazing, the hoof action, the manure, all of that interaction from those grazing animals to be healthy on that. And so that's why, yeah, maybe we eat too much red meat. I won't maybe deny that. Um, but there's a place for that. And again, having our pets be a part of that to eat the parts of the animal that we're not eating. Mm -hmm. To balance that carcass utilization helps support those ranches that are out there that are raising livestock that are enhancing the grasslands. Darren, I see Jim nodding pretty enthusiastically. I haven't gotten the, the discord from this question. I thought I was going to. Do you want to agree or <laughs> yeah, do you have so a hot different take? I, I, like, I like kind of how it came out. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So look, I think I think the question is not whether or not we're going to go vegan or vegetarian. The question is, do we have the resources to continue to, to continue to produce the amount of meat that we currently have in the way that we currently do it? And that is an unequivocal no, right? Like that's, that's completely, so that's where we sit. I mean, I think we need to recognize that things that are better for the planet will produce less, um, less product and we need to find that. And I, so I think that's absolutely fine. I mean, I, I certainly see, you know, value to things like, you know, black soldier fly larvae. I think that's a really big, interesting thing. It's a little early to say if it's silver bullety or not. And I, I think we should be fine with progress over, you know, over, you know, small progress is still progress over just waiting for the big leaps, right? It's better, it could potentially be better than what we're currently doing for protein. Um, you know, and so look, we know we know that the environmentally probably have less impact. We know that there's been some studies recently also on putting live black black fly soldier larvae into chicken um, production systems and into to mm -hmm. aquaculture, and we're seeing really improvement in leg health and quality of life based on that. So, you know, I there's going to be a lot of ideas, a lot of things going on. Um, yeah, I think we just need to look at our consumption more than I think at this point. I think that's an interesting take from all of you. All right, gentlemen, um, we've got people chomping at the bit to ask you your questions. So I'm going to ask you uh, one more, um, and then we're going to open it up to the team. Of, uh, You've got a magic wand. What's the 60-second answer? If you could see the pet industry take one short-term action over the next eight 
12 to 18 months and one longer term action over the next three to five years, um, what will it be? I'll throw it back to you, Darren. What you can do with your magic wand? Well, nothing to do with you. Um, <laughs> I'm going to find something much better to do. So look, I think short term, uh, we need to start talking to, to the value chain. We need to start having those conversations. I mean, I think the, the other two gentlemen on here, you know, recognize the value of engaging with value chains. I think being clear about what our expectations are for the protein that we're sourcing, um, understanding what the impact that would be on farmers and how we move forward. Um, you know, I, I think most importantly uh, for the beef and, and all the other ruminants, we need to figure out traceability. So that's a conversation that you want to start having. If you're if you're not sourcing from, you know, the sort of super high welfare, the, the regen thing, that those really great things. If you're sourcing from commodities, you want to understand transparency. You want to, and you want transparency, you want to understand traceability uh, because you're likely getting a bunch of things you didn't know you were getting. Um, and long term, I think we just want to agree on what we want to measure. I think um, if we're going to move, we need to have you know some common metrics that that we share with producers, with processors, and with other industries. And so I think there's a real opportunity to align with other industries moving forward. I love the measurement piece. Uh, people get very tired of me saying you can't improve what you can't measure. Uh, <laughs> All right, Jim, you've got a big microphone and a magic wand. What's the what's the 12 to 18 month plan and the three to five month plan, a three to five year plan? Well, I think it reflects a lot of what we've already been talking about. I think I, yeah. we'd love to see, and I think we're seeing it, but I think maybe it needs to coalesce more is this, this demand for these different categories. And I agree with Darren, it's not about just one. It's about how do you bring that value proposition back kind of in the different ways that, that we're seeing it in meat. And that can be local. That can be antibiotic free. That can be regenerative. It can be organic. It can be some kind. It can be savory. It can be you know, land to market. It can be some combination of these. But we have, you know, we kind of came into this with OHP, you know, hoping that there would be a value seen in that end because we saw enough of it in our worlds and meat and milk, eggs, the other. But Dave's point is critical. The difference in why we have to get so much for our steaks and everything in the grass fed space is partly because we get nothing or have to pay for something over here. And if that balances out with a value proposition for the pet food industry, that's a win for everyone. So I think starting to identify and coalesce some of those demand areas. And then I think the longer term thing, and this it's both short and long term, is how we had to do it is to Timberland's credit, they started with 20 highs with us. You know, they literally helped to figure that's not how Timberland buys leather, I will just say in general, um, is 20 hides at a time. And so you also have to work at a scale that can work with the sector you're talking about. If you're waiting for 18 truckloads to a show up, I mean, if that's all you do is open your market at the scale you're already at, it's going to take us a while. We might not get there. Um, but if but if you work with Dave, work with folks like us to figure out, and, and especially the native communities who are working a lot of space to aggregate and build a, supply, a, a demand tied to your supply and products, that's the kind of thing that can pull all the way through and add so much additional value, truthfully, back down all the way through to, to the and to the pet owner. So I think it's, it's a, that's one of your bigger win wins you can get. I love I love the perspective, Dave, of not trying to tackle your entire consumption uh, chain all at the same time. All right, Dave, I'm going to I'm going to open it up to the audience. But before I do, what do you want to do on the next 12 to 18 months and three to five years, sir? Well, I think that there's a huge opportunity to create what I like to call a multi-local uh, sourcing system. And, um, you know, one of the things, if anybody gets a chance, go to Native American Agriculture Fund, uh, their website, and they put out a vision document that's, that's talked about regional food hubs, food processing hubs. And I know that pet food manufacturers, they need ingredients that meet certain specs, quality specs, and moisture and fat and you know all of these type of things. But if we could invest, if we could provide some investment for these small meat processors to have the technology to be able to put up those ingredients in a uniform standard, then a pet food manufacturer could get those quality ingredients rather than having to go to one large JBS or Smithfield mm -hmm. or whatever plant to be able to source it from the, the multi, you know, multiple locations, but still have the quality standards that are there. 
And, you know, they would get the quality. It keeps the agriculture local. It supports those farmers. But I would say the other thing that it does too is it supports the workers. You know, one of the challenges that we have as we're trying to stand up a lot of local meat processing plants is you don't take a worker from a JBS plant that is a, you know, unskilled worker on an assembly line doing a repetitive motion every day and put them into a small processing plant because we need skilled butchers in those mm -hmm. plants that can do multi things. And so, you know, it's supporting the animals, it's supporting the environment, it's supporting the workers, and it's getting good quality ingredients out there. I, I love it. Um, well, let's see what questions. We've got a whole bunch of great ones. I'd also uh, love to invite uh, Caitlin Dudash, who's the PSC Executive Director and Co-Founder to join this conversation as well. So thanks for joining, Caitlin. Um, and let uh, to let everyone know, we're taking questions in the Q&A part at the bottom of your screen, but we've got a bunch and I'm going to try and get through as many as we can. So opening it up with the panel, maybe starting with you, Caitlin, um, are there any other industries or multi-state group or multi-stakeholder groups, excuse me, um, that are really impactful in the way they are bringing forward um, these kind of collaborative solutions. I, I think it's what we're trying to ask is, you know, who's doing a great job that the pet industry can learn from? Yeah, so I really look forward to hearing that answer from our panelists today, um, because I think their experience outside of the pet industry is critical to understand. But I would say as an organization, you know, PSC is currently um, beginning a program to really understand the stakeholder perspective on proteins raised in the industry, who the players are, and also looking at models that we can replicate, right? So not just reinventing the wheel as a pet industry, um, or, you know, not starting from scratch or not participating in an active movement that's happening outside of our industry, um, because, you know, that would take much longer. Um, and honestly, I think, you know, there's some urgency around how long our soils are going to be around for, um, and how much catch up work we're doing uh, to really to really move to a more sustainable system. Um, so I'd love to pass that question on uh, to Dave and Jim and Darren, uh, because I think you all have some insights about what's working uh, that PSC might be able to model after as well. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna pick on you guys. Okay, I'll jump in. Um, you know, there are so many producers out there that are not only what, kind of re-looking at how they raise their animals, but the impact on, on the environment. And um, I know we have folks out there that are measuring uh, specifically the, the carbon sequestration that's going on in, in their soil and quantifying that. And again, I mentioned, you know, that the uh, administration's making a $1 billion commitment to climate smart agriculture partnerships. And so um, I think that that, is something that the pet industry needs to be part of because part of what they're investing money in is how do you monetize? How do you take climate friendly agriculture practices into the marketplace? Well, again, when you're in animal agriculture, you can't have that conversation without talking about the pet industry. Jim, what do you think? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think, I mean, we've obviously had the experience from the leather and apparel industry. I think that's one that's been the next level. Obviously, we start with meat. We've, we've learned so much from meat, milk, and all the work that, that the farmers did to set up, you know, differentiated markets, what Dave and others did with NLP, everything, you know, the work that's been done along the way to start to create these higher value, but more kind of dependable market spaces, right, where you can actually look to get not just a commodity price, but a, a more fair price, let's be honest, because um, those two are not the same thing. And so for us, that's the key here is how do you carry those things forward? And we've been very lucky, uh, Timberland and other apparel companies, we work with large and small uh, leather users now who are really understanding and demanding that they get, that they know where that leather is coming from. And we're able to trace it back with the partnerships we have, starting with the producer groups on the ground, back to the ground, because we know that meat's traceable, we know that hide's traceable. The same is possible for all those other parts. And we're working with some of those same grass-fed regenerative and organic producers around the country. And they're clamoring for other ways to literally have better value propositions. So, um, so I think there's a lot of industries to learn from, but right now leather and the stuff we're doing there and the kind of work to aggregate and add value to space that literally we've added so much more money back to the producers directly and then actually back to those processors all the way to supply chain because everyone has to benefit to do something different. 
And so that's one of the lessons that I think they're, they're figuring out is they want a different supply product. You need a different uh, a way of doing it. And, and leather's working on it. Meat has done it for a long time. I guess you're just looking at me. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Derek. I, 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 don't, I don't know why I picked that up, but um, anyways. Uh, yeah, so I, you know, I think there are two things that I would think of. I think this, this I, I agree with, um, with Jim and Dave on the sort of um, this, this regen model, you know, that works going. I think there's also a role for, um, for PSC to play in the, in, in the commodity market, the larger conventional industry. I think, you know, when we think about the rush to the middle, that's gonna come from people doing great things like those two, but also from, we need to just move the industry, uh, the larger conventional commodity industry from where they are, we need to move them forward. So in saying that, I think there's really value to working with, you know, other sort of global and, and commodity focused organizations. So you know you'll see things like uh the business uh council for sustainable development who've done some really great work on understanding um on, on accounting for impacts they've done some great work on that uh just because i work for them i'd probably get fired the global coalition for animal welfare is really doing some really interesting work on it and although but there's just this opportunity to align with you know to, to caitlin's point you don't need to do it because they're already doing it uh completely agree with Jim that um, the, the, the working groups for the apparel industry have done a lot of really great work. There's still work to be done, but you know, they're moving forward. I think, I think the size of this just, it, it took us 40 years to get here in production, right? For the conventional produ production. It took like 40 years of a lot of resources, a lot of time, a lot of decisions. It's not gonna take us, you know, six months to get out of it and move forward. So I think that larger, uh, working with those larger groups is really going to help have some sort of impact. Thank you, Darren. Uh, Caitlin, Q and A is exploding. Which one, I, I'm having a hard time picking. Which one do you want to? Do you yeah, sure. Thanks, Melissa. Um, so, getting some great questions in the Q and A, um, and there's one about kind of regional um, farms. And then, you know, Darren, you were also talking about conventional. And I'd love to kind of just pose, you know, a question around what's the role for regional and conventional uh, around this issue? So a big push I'm hearing from Dave and Jim, you know, but I've seen great work um, in the chicken space by Tyson. Um, and so we've seen some big commercial players make some pretty substantial shifts, uh, specifically around things like animal welfare. Um, and so I'm curious just to get your insights about um, about how both uh, both parties might be required or if you have a, a strong sense of um, why only a regional um, player would be able to look at performance standards in all four key areas as well. I jumped in first last time, Jim, so you take this one. Sure, give me the heart. Um... But Darren always has to go last. I see how you're Darren, do you want to go first on this one? We'd love to have you go first on this. I agree. Darren, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, I'll do it. That's it. Um, all right. There, so I agree with Caitlin. There's no data showing that size um, is a determinant of welfare outcomes or environmental. The the joy of a and 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 it, it the joy of a large regional, a large company. Um, as Dave mentioned, is really that their ability to to have consistent standard operating procedures and ensuring that they actually happen. Sorry, I don't know why dogs are suddenly barking. Um, so, I so I think there's real value there. I think I think a a sustainable protein chain has both, and I think that they're both really important. Um, so I I you know I. There are great people working, you know, to 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 um, Caitlin's point about Tyson and other large organizations. We're seeing Purdue doing some great things. Um, yeah, so it's not size; it's their their focus on the future and where they think they're going to be that will determine what what their outputs are. Yeah, um, I can. I mean, yes, and I mean, I guess instead, I, I, obviously, we need to lift all. I mean, when the vast number of vast, vast majority of animals raised for meat and, you know, the 
pets and consumer are under these corporations, obviously we can't ignore that and say, oh, that's over here. Um, they don't deserve to be better. And the producers, all the folks who, who work with those animals and do their best to take care of them, regardless of some of the predatory kind of situations that are put in by many of those corporations. Um, yes, obviously it needs to matter. And there's a lot of advantages, kind of some stuff Dave talked about. There's some trade-offs with vertical integration that allows a lot more pass-through. I think it still has to go back to looking at what that's incenting and how it's incenting it and not pretending that, you know, that band-aiding some things is going to be the same thing and you're going to get the same outcome of health, uh, animal welfare, farmer and rural vitality without addressing some of those core issues that are at scale questions, you know, 50,000 chickens in a barn, pretty hard to make humane at the same level as, you know, a lot, you know, one that drops a couple of zeros. Um, can you make it better? Yes. Are you going to meet the same level of welfare? I don't, I don't agree you can probably, and certainly the farmer is in, in the position to do that. So I think it gets pretty hard. It gets pretty hard to, to put a comparison, but no, they all have a role to play. We want all of our, we want improvements across the board. And what we have is hopefully the smaller and medium-sized ones showing the way, partly, and starting to, to grow their system so that we aren't looking at, we aren't only looking at one option for how we organize around agricultural value adding and ownership. You know, and I'm going to just be, yeah, you know, sort of a ditto comment here because despite everything I've said before, I don't think that there's a direct connection between scale in, in some of these. I think some of the practices and, you know, I think about organic, uh, the organic standards were made so that you, it's, it, it's not about a uniform cookie cutter thing to happen. It's about knowing your soil, knowing your animals, what your environment is doing. And by extension, that should favor a small producer there. But if larger producers can figure out a way to do that, then that starts to make major change. And I think about, you know, the, the pork industry just said for years that it was impossible to raise uh, hogs without gestation crates. And then all of a sudden McDonald's came in and said, we're not gonna buy pork from producers that use gestation crates. And they all said, well, maybe it is possible, you know? And so that, from, so, you know, I think from that standpoint is, you know, big is not necessarily better, but there's some value in a local regional food system that creates ultimately a more resilient food system. Um, you know, I've seen small ranchers abuse animals. I've seen large ranchers take very good care of animals. And so, you know, we need to take a look at how, what, are, what are the best practices to do that? And how can we emphasize a more regional food system so that we have more food security for communities and, and tribal nations and everyone else? I really appreciate all of you taking the time um, to respond to that. And I know we're getting really close to time. Um, so I have a three pages full of kind of nuggets that came out of this um, and really appreciate all of the attention from each of you. I agree that this is a multi-stakeholder effort that we need small and we need big. Um, and all of you have had incredible insights to share with our community. So I feel so grateful for all of your time. I speak about this often from PSE's perspective, um, but all of you have spent careers um, really working, whether it's in the dirt um, or with companies. Um, and so really appreciate you all taking the time. So I just, there was one comment that came in on the Q&A that I wanna make sure I address. It was a question about nutrition. Um, and just wanna reiterate that I apologize that we didn't have our nutrition expert available to join us today. Um, it is absolutely essential that we're meeting the nutritional needs of animals. Um, for lots of reasons, but we're really creating a different sustainability problem um, if you know that's not a factor, which is why it's one of the four key factors overall. Um, and in our next series, we will have um, one of our member experts does have a background in nutrition, and so we'll be really excited to bring that back into the conversation as well. So PSE is not proposing um, that we ditch nutrition uh, in favor of the other three factors, but that we take um, an approach that really is inclusive of all of them and encourage companies to identify what their priorities are as well. Um, and so I will hand it over to Melissa to go ahead and uh, wrap up today. 
Yeah, thank you so much, Caitlin. And thank you so much to all of our fantastic panelists that we had today. Um, so this is not the end of the discussion and uh, PSC really encourages you and everyone on the call to be part of this collaborate solution and conversation. So there's a couple of different ways that you can do that. First of all, if you have not already done so, we really will hope that you will download and read the four factor framework. Um, we've included the link and I'll make sure we include it in the follow up. We we also hope that you will join PSE to be part of this conversation around sustainable protein, but also our other strategic initiatives as well. Um, and then as always, we appreciate any uh, financial support for this important work. So there's an opportunity uh, to donate and con contribution support pioneering work to lead this industry. Um, we have a couple of upcoming events. We hope you will join us. So this is the second of a three-part series. As Caitlin mentioned, we uh, have a third part coming up next month on March 17th, where we'll be talking about member pa panel um, from PSC members who are grappling with this. Um, and strategic sourcing and protein is only part of the work that we do. Um, so we actually have um, an event coming up in just a few weeks on February 22nd through the 24th uh, on PACT, which is the, the only summit dedicated specifically two and a half days uh, for packaging in the pet industry. So we hope that you will join us uh, for one or both of those next events. Um, but thank you so much. If there's anything that we can be doing, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at info at petsustainability.org uh, and have a wonderful day. Thank you so, so much to Caitlin and all of our panelists. Bye-bye.